I'd like to welcome you. We're so glad you're here. Um, you may need to scooch your behinds in a little bit, especially if there's wood to be seen. There are some more folks coming in. We'd love to get them seated on the floor here. That'd be great. There is some seating at the sides, though, folks coming in. Hey, my name's Nick Gibson. I'm the senior pastor here at High Point, and um, I'm going to introduce Dr. Hardin, who will then introduce Dr. Lennox. And the reason for that is, is because uh, Dr. Lennox is going to give an address, and then afterwards, Dr. Hardin is going to come up and be his interlocutor. He'll ask him a bunch of questions, um, that hopefully that arise out of the talk. Now, um, if you have questions that you would hope Dr. Hardin might allude to, there's two ways that you can get those questions to us so we can look through them. Either you can tweet them to our Twitter handle, which is HPC Madison. If you tweet them, I'll, I'll get them on my phone. I can pass them off to Dr. Hardin. Or one of my email addresses is Nick, N-I-C, at highpointchurch.org. And I'll keep looking at my phone. And if you send me a question, I'll show it to Dr. Hardin. We'll try to collate them and, and try to make sure that Dr. Lennox is, is answering the most difficult most prescient questions possible, okay? So that's what we're doing, okay. Uh, Dr. Hardin lives here in Madison, but in case you don't know him, let me just give you the quick bio. He received his undergraduate degrees in zoology and German, and you, you can say boo after I read this next part, from Michigan State University. Yeah. Yeah. He's reformed, hopefully. He then pursued a Master's of Divinity at International School of Theology in Southern California. Um, after seminar, he did a PhD in biophysics at University of California, Berkeley, and did postdoc at Duke. He's professor in the zoology department, now integrative biology at UW since 1991, and is, he's in his 10th year of chair of the department. He also is part of the director of the Isthmus Society, which fosters dialogues between science and religion on the UW campus. So Dr. Hard, why don't you come and introduce our guest. Now, I would like to point out that I turned down a job at the University of Michigan to take the one at Wisconsin. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it is so great to see all of you here tonight. Wow, fantastic. Um, it's my job to introduce our speaker for this evening. And as Nick said, I will be back with uh, Dr. Lennox after his remarks are over. But I'd like to provide a few words of introduction about our topic, and then a few words of introduction of, of John. Our topic for tonight is, can a scientist believe in the resurrection? Now, central to classical Orthodox Christian faith is the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. The Apostle Paul said it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we of all people are most to be pitied. So the Apostle Paul makes a claim about the centrality of the resurrection to Christian faith. Uh, Oxford academic, Oxford and Cambridge academic, C.S. Lewis said it this way, the first fact in the history of Christendom is a number of people who say they have seen the resurrection. Presbyterian pastor from New York City, Tim Keller, said it this way quite famously, we should be most sympathetic to our skeptical friends. The resurrection makes Christianity the most irritating religion on the face of the earth. The resurrection is a paradigm-shattering historical event. So Christians claim the centrality of the resurrection, but can a scientist take the resurrection seriously? Many scientists would say not. Take, for instance, Richard Dawkins in his book, The God Delusion. The 19th century is the last time when it was possible for an educated person to admit to believing in miracles like the virgin birth without embarrassment. When pressed, many educated Christians are too loyal to deny the virgin birth and the resurrection. But it embarrasses them because their rational minds know that it is absurd, so that they would much rather not be asked. So is that the case? Must one choose between science and the resurrection? Well, our speaker tonight, Dr. John Lennox, will address that very topic. And then, as Pastor Nick said, I hope you have some good questions, and I'll certainly be... Uh, developing my own. 
Let me introduce John, and then we'll invite him up to the podium. John Lennox is Professor of Mathematics Emeritus at the University of Oxford and Emeritus Fellow in Mathematics and the Philosophy of Science. He's also an adjunct lecturer at Wycliffe Hall, Oxford, and at the Oxford Center for Christian Apologetics, as well as a senior fellow at the Trinity Forum. In addition, he's an associate fellow of the Said Business School, Oxford University, and teaches for the Oxford Strategic Leadership Program. Professor Lennox did most of his uh, post-secondary education at Cambridge University, where he received a bachelor's, master's, and PhD degrees in mathematics. He worked for many years in the Mathematics Institute at the University of Wales in Cardiff, which awarded him a DSC for his research. Professor Lennox was a senior Alexander von Humboldt fellow at the universities of Würzburg and Freiburg in Germany. And in addition, he has published over 70 mathematical papers. He's the co-author of two research level texts in abstract algebra and group theory um, in the Oxford Mathematical Monograph series. But he's also interested in the interface between science, philosophy, and theology. And he's written a number of books with titles like these. God's Undertaker, Has Science Buried God? God and Stephen Hawking and Gunning for God. His most recent title is Against the Flow, The Inspiration of Daniel in an Age of Relativism. Professor Lennox has lectured extensively in Europe, both Eastern and Western, in the UK, and in North America, and in the Southern Hemisphere. We are delighted to have Dr. John Lennox with us, and uh, please welcome him to the stage. Ladies and gentlemen, are you sitting comfortably? <laughs> well, so am I. You may not be used to someone sitting and speaking, but in Russia, that is what they do all the time. And I got used to it in my many visits to that part of the world, although there was a snag that when you gave a lecture in Russia, they always had a little table in front. And during the lecture, people would come up and they'd respectfully bow to you, and then they'd leave a piece of paper on the table. It was a question. And of course, the longer you spoke, the higher the pile grew. <laughs> it's a marvelous way of regulating the time speakers speak, even today. Also, for those of you familiar with that book, the Bible, which has already been cited, it was the custom of ancient rabbis to sit and speak. But my real reason is I'm old, and <laughs> I'm discovering bones that I didn't even believe were there. Let me thank you so very warmly for inviting me, and particularly to the senior pastor, Nick, to this lovely church. It's always one of the special things for me when I'm lecturing in universities around the world to see living Christianity working out at the level of the church. So I feel particularly honored to be here and to see that I'm not like the bishop who turned up at a little country church on Sunday and he got up into the pulpit and he saw there were three old ladies sitting in the darkness at the back. And the local vicar was standing beside him and he said, did you tell them I was coming? He said, no, but word seems to have got around. <laughs> now, I've loved logic since childhood. And the title I've been given tonight is, can a scientist believe in the resurrection? The answer is yes, and you've just heard one, Dr. Hardin is a scientist who believes in the resurrection. So my case is proved. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I think you may want me to say a little bit more than that. 
Because behind that, there is the question, why would a scientist, and how can a scientist believe in the resurrection? And as Dr. Hardin very clearly said, this is the central claim of the Christian faith, around which everything else revolves. And it is very clearly a claim that nature is not all that exists. The resurrection introduces us to a clash of worldviews, which you find in the first century and you find in my university in the 21st century. The one worldview is what we call materialism or naturalism, which says this world, this universe, made of physics and chemistry, elementary particles and so on, is all that exists. There is no transcendence. Against that, there is the worldview of theism, Christian theism in my case, that believes that this world exists, but it is a creation. It was created by God, and it is upheld by God. And because of that, it is not a closed system of cause and effect. And the real issue behind the resurrection of Jesus is it threatens the notion of this universe as a closed system of cause and effect. And it is very interesting that it was objected to right at the very beginning. Can a scientist or how would a scientist believe in the resurrection? But it started right at the very start, how could anybody believe that a person could be raised from the dead? And the Greek word that describes that is anastasis, from which the name Anastasia come. It means anastasis, to stand up again. It implies a physical returning from death. And of course, it challenges materialism. It raises the specter of supernaturalism, and it was resisted from the very beginning. The first objections to the Christian faith didn't come from atheists, but it came from professional theologians called Sadducees, who did not believe in spirit or resurrection, and they objected to the early Christian apostles preaching, and notice carefully what Luke tells us. Luke is a brilliant historian, and that has been proved again and again. They preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. You see, they weren't simply objecting to a general concept that there would be a resurrection at the end of time. The Pharisees believed that. And they wouldn't have made a fuss about it. It was a specific resurrection they were objecting to. This claim that at a particular time, there was an event that happened. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, my experience has been that although I believe there is powerful historical and indeed empirical evidence that Jesus rose from the dead, many people, particularly the more vocal opponents of Christianity, will not even consider it and may descend to ridicule. In my first debate with Richard Dawkins in Birmingham, Alabama, we were suddenly told without warning that the Debate had to end in something like two minutes each instead of what we'd been promised before. And I decided to go for the central fact of the resurrection of Jesus. And Dawkins' reaction rings in my ears as I sit here talking to you. So that's where we end. We've been talking about great philosophical ideas. We've been talking about wonderful things. But now we come down to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I quote, it's so petty, it's so trivial, it's so local, it's so earthbound, it's so unworthy of the universe. Well, if Jesus rose from the dead, the last thing is 
that it's unworthy of the universe. The question is, is the universe worthy of it? But that's the reaction, ridicule. And when I had a second debate with him in the Oxford Museum of Natural History, he mocked my belief in the miracles of Jesus, turning water into wine and so on. But mockery, of course, is not an argument. It's an attitude. And it does no credit to the person who employs it. For if there is a God, as I pointed out to Dawkins, who created the universe, then there's no difficulty in believing that he could and might do special things. Of course, whether he has done so on a specific occasion is a different matter. And that's why it's important that we realize from the outset that we're talking not about claims to miracle in general. We're talking about something very specific on which Christianity is founded. Francis Collins, who's the director of the NIH here, who believes in the resurrection of Jesus, very wisely says, it is crucial that a healthy skepticism be applied when interpreting potentially miraculous events, lest the integrity and rationality of the religious perspective be brought into question. The only thing that will kill the possibility of miracles more quickly than a committed materialism is the claiming of miraculous status for everyday events for which natural explanations are readily at hand. And for that reason, we're concentrating on the resurrection. Now, I've used the word miracle, I've used the word supernatural. There is a distinction between the two that needs to be made. Miracles, that is genuine miracles, are supernatural events. But not all supernatural events are miracles in the strict sense, because miracles are usually thought to concern events that are exceptions, or apparent exceptions, to an already recognized normal course of things. They presuppose a normal course of things. Dead bodies don't normally rise from the dead. So the creation of the universe with its inbuilt normal course of things is utterly supernatural because God is behind it, but it's not a miracle. Because the thing that sets up the normal course of things is, of course, not an apparent exception to them. And I like the fact that Dr. Hardin quoted C.S. Lewis. As you see, I'm very old. I'm old enough, actually, to have heard C.S. Lewis. I heard the very last lectures he gave. And the quotation that Jeff gave us is a very important one. He read, the first fact in the history of Christendom is a number of people who say they have seen the resurrection. If they had died without making anyone else believe this gospel, no gospels would ever have been written. According to the early Christians, without the resurrection, there simply is no Christian message. And Paul writes, if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. I spent my life from boyhood, convinced that this is the message that needs to be unpacked and explained to the world. But I've noticed that people's reaction to explanations of that fact over time has changed. Now, I do believe there is considerable evidence that establishes the credibility and believability of the resurrection of Jesus. Time is not going to permit a lot of delving into that tonight, but that's why I'm going to do a bit of shameless advertising. I've written this little book called Gunning for God, and the last two chapters of it are an analysis from a biblical perspective, but with a particular angle, which I'll, I'll explain later of the biblical evidence for the truth of that resurrection. But where I find a problem, not only in academic circles, but with the general public, is there's no point in looking at it. Don't talk to me about the resurrection of Jesus. Why? Because miracles cannot happen anyway. 
And miracles cannot happen anyway. There is no point in discussing the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. And I understand that. That's a perfectly logical stance. The problem often is a direct refusal to look at evidence. I chatted to Richard Dawkins once and about the resurrection, and he said, I cannot even imagine anybody being interested in it. And the reason for that is contained in the other quotation that Jeff gave us, and that is Dawkins thinks that the uh, 18th or 19th century was the last time that anybody could credibly believe in such things. The reason is, of course, the bottom line is science has rendered miracles impossible, so there is simply no need to go there. Now, a lot of that goes back to the Enlightenment philosopher, the Scotsman David Hume. And in my second debate with the late Christopher Hitchens, again in Alabama, I suddenly get involved with Alabama, it's a very interesting thing, but Alabama it was, and it's a wonderful place in my experience for doing these things, but Christopher Hitchens tried, some of you will have seen it on YouTube, to convince the audience that David Hume had said the last word of the issue of miracles, ruling them out in the name of science. And of course, Hitchens was referring to a famous essay of Hume in which he said the following. A miracle is a violation of the laws of nature. And as a firm and unalterable experience has established these laws, the proof against a miracle from the very nature of the fact is as entire as any argument from experience as can be imagined. It is no miracle that a man seemingly in good health should die suddenly, because such a kind of death though more unusual than any other, has yet been frequently observed to happen. But it is a miracle that a dead man should come to life. Notice the example that Hume chooses. It is a miracle that a dead man should come to life because that has never been observed in any age or country. There must therefore be a uniform experience against every miraculous event, otherwise the event would not merit that appellation. Now, the logic of those last two sentences is disastrous, but we'll come to it in a little while. Hume wasn't the first to say things like that. Spinoza, in the 17th century, said, quotes, nothing then happens in nature which is in contradiction with its universal laws. She, nature, preserves a fixed and immutable course. A miracle, whether contrary to nature or above nature, is a sheer absurdity, and therefore, by a miracle in Holy Scripture, we are to understand nothing more than a natural phenomenon which surpasses or is believed to surpass human powers of comprehension. Now, that view has been powerfully influential, not only in philosophy and in common understanding, but also in theology. Rudolf Bultmann, very famously in 1933, wrote, the idea of a miracle as a divine intervention has become impossible for us today. And this view has been responsible for the fact that some scientists, though they believe in God in some sense, are very skeptical of the claim that the processes by which the universe and life uh, came to be, that they involved any divine intervention, is the word that's often used. Nancy Murphy says we object to intervention as a kind of divine action because it seems unreasonable that God should violate the laws he has established. So here's the argument. Firstly, miracles are violations of the laws of nature. Secondly, those laws have been established by firm and unalterable experience. Thirdly, therefore the argument against miracle is as good as any argument from experience can be. Hume has a second layer of arguments, and that's from the uniformity of experience. And that goes like this. Unusual yet frequently observed events are not miracles, like a healthy person dropping dead. A resurrection would be a miracle because it has never been observed. There is uniform experience against every miraculous event, otherwise it would not be called miraculous. 
Now, in light of the New Testament, that is a very odd statement because, of course, the whole claim of the New Testament is a resurrection was observed. And the uniformity of, of experience is not something that carries through. So, atheists and everybody else universally recognized with David Hume that certainly the supernatural would be involved in the standing up of a body again. Now, Hume is a very interesting person in terms of his philosophy. I just want to say one or two things about him because there are very deep self-contradictions that take a lot of the apparent bite, and it's only apparent, of his argument. He says miracles can't happen because they go against the laws of nature. Hume believes that the laws of nature entail regularities of, success, of succession. But unfortunately, in other parts of his work, he denies the uniformity of nature. Just because, he says, the sun has been observed to rise in the morning for thousands of years, that doesn't mean that we can be sure it will rise tomorrow. And this is an example of what's called the problem of induction. On the basis of past experience, you cannot predict the future. But then, if Hume is right that no dead man has ever risen up from the grave through the whole of Earth's history so far, then by his own argument, he still couldn't be sure that a dead man will not rise up tomorrow. That being so, he cannot rule out miracles. There's a fundamental flaw in his argument. And that same argument works backwards in time as well as forwards. The fact that no one has been observed to rise from the dead, say, in the past thousand years, is no guarantee there was no resurrection before that. You see, what's at stake here is this. Uniformity is one thing. Absolute uniformity entirely another. But it's worse still, because if... Hume is right in saying we cannot infer regularities, then you couldn't even speak of a law of nature. And if nature's laws don't make sense, there's no uniformity of nature, and therefore you can't use this as an argument against miracles. And I find it simply astonishing that Hume's argument has been in large responsible for the widespread contemporary view, in my experience, in the Western world, that we have a straightforward choice between mutually exclusive alternatives. Either we believe in miracles or we believe in the scientific understanding of the laws of nature, but not both. And it was that that prompted Dawkins' remark that Jeff told us the 19th century is the last time when it was possible for an educated person to admit to believing in miracles like the virgin birth without embarrassment. When pressed, many educated Christians are too loyal to deny the virgin birth and the re resurrection, but it embarrasses them because the rational minds know that it is absurd so that they would much rather not be asked. But just a moment. There are very eminent scientists, light years brighter than Richard Dawkins, who do believe in the resurrection of Jesus. Think of your professor Bill Phillips, USA Physics Nobel Prize winner, 1998. Professor Sir John Polkinghorne, who taught me quantum mechanics uh, at Cambridge and is a member of our academy. Sir John Houghton, also an academician, formerly head of the UK Meteorological Office and director of the Intergovernmental Climate Panel that won the Nobel Prize. All of these people assert their faith in the resurrection of Christ without embarrassment or any sense of irrationality or absurdity. This shows very clearly, ladies and gentlemen, that it is no necessary part of being a scientist that one should reject either the possibility or the actuality of the resurrection of Christ. But to see why such scientists, myself included, do not feel remotely threatened by the accusations that miracles cannot happen because they're violations of the laws of nature, we must look just a little bit 
more carefully at that claim. I pointed out that Hume didn't really believe in the laws of nature and therefore couldn't believe in its uniformity because he denied necessary causation. I don't want to go into the philosophy of that, except to tell you this. One of Richard Dawkins' forerunners as the world's most famous atheist was Professor Anthony Flew of Reading University, a famous philosopher, who was Hume's leading interpreter. And before he died a few years ago, I had the privilege of spending a couple of hours with him in his home and talking about these things. And it's very humbling to listen to a world-class philosopher claim that for most of his life he'd been wrong. He said to me directly, he said, I was wrong about you. And all my books would have to be rewritten. But I will never get round to that. It's very humbling when you hear someone of that class do that. And I talked to him at great length and he wrote a book. He wrote a very interesting book. There is a God. And it's in two halves. He writes the first half as to how he came to believe in God very interestingly, through his understanding of the nature of the complexity of DNA. It's a linguistic complexity. And he could see, like most people can see when they think about it, that the moment you see language, the moment you see language up on the screen there, you know that whatever physical, chemical, Natural processes are involved in putting that up on the wall. There's a mind involved in it. Because there is no adequate explanation of linguistic phenomena without postulating a mind. And he extrapolated that, not unreasonably as I would do, to DNA and came to believe in a God. He became a kind of deist. <laughs> but then... He invited his friend N.T. Wright to write the second half of the book because he said, if I was going to go for any religion, I would go for Christianity, so I'll get my friend N.T. Wright to write about the resurrection of Jesus. So you have this very interesting book with a scientist who's got so far, being honest, I haven't got quite that far, so I'll get my friend to write the book. And I remember coming away from that thinking, would I have the guts to admit that I've been wrong? You know, most of us find it very difficult to say sorry and to say we've been wrong. But when your life's work is dedicated to expounding David Hume's philosophy to say I was wrong. So I have Anthony Flew's word for it. Hume is simply wrong. And his arguments do not have that power. I'll quote Anthony Flew. Generations of Humeans have in consequence been misled into offering analyses of causation and of natural law that have been far too weak because they had no basis for accepting the existence of either cause and effect or natural laws. Hume's skepticism about cause and effect and his agnosticism about the external world are of course jettisoned the moment he leaves his study. It's strange that Christopher Hitchens thought that Hume wrote the last word of the subject. But then Hitchens isn't a scientist. And I said publicly, and you can see it in the debate, I said Hume was wrong about this. And I can explain it to you in several sentences. And afterwards he came to me. I got on very well with Christopher Hitchens. He said, that was heavy stuff, you know. That was very heavy stuff about Hume. I said, of course it was. But he said, but Richard Dawkins. I said, Richard Dawkins hasn't a clue about Hume. And all you've done is follow him. He says, I suppose I have. He was pretty honest about some things when you got close to him. But not everybody who regards miracles as violations of the laws of nature would argue like Hume. Because many of my colleagues resent, and it really is a resentment, any idea that some god, small g or big g, 
could arbitrarily intervene and alter, suspend, reverse, or otherwise violate the laws of nature, because that would seem to contradict the immutability of the law. Stephen Hawking, in his book, The Grand Design, goes along with this notion. And to support it, they come up with a number of arguments. The first is which is this. Belief in miracles in general, and in the New Testament miracles in particular, arose in a primitive pre-scientific culture where people were ignorant of the laws of nature and so readily accepted miracle stories. Now this is Hume again in a different part of his book. That's exactly what he says. But that's a very curious thing. That explanation that they didn't know the regularities of nature is actually logically absurd because in order to recognize any event as a miracle, there must be some perceived regularity that you know to which that event is an apparent exception. You cannot spot an abnormality if you don't know what's normal. And here is where the only scientifically trained person who writes the New Testament comes into his own, Dr. Luke. He was a polymath, a brilliant historian and a medical doctor. And he begins his biography of Jesus, the Gospel of Luke, by raising this matter. This is something that's weighed with me for years as being extremely important. The very first issue he raises is the difficulty people of his day had in accepting anything supernatural. He tells the story of Zechariah, who was a priest, and his wife Elizabeth, and they prayed for a child for many years, and they had no child. And then they got very old. And in his old age, he was leading the worship at the temple in Jerusalem, and an angel appears, Luke tells us, and says, your prayers are answered, and your wife is going to have a son. And he said, absolutely not. He said, we're too old. You see, he knew as well as any gynecologist today that you get to a state where you cannot bear children. Now, he wasn't an atheist. He was a priest. He was praying. So he believed God. He believed in prayer. And he appeared to believe in angels because he spoke to one. (laughs) But answering as a prayer involved a reversal of nature's powers a regeneration, and he couldn't believe that. You see, this is the problem. He knew the course of nature. That's why he said this is absolutely ridiculous. And by the way, uh, this is just an aside, he was struck dumb for being silly. He had no message when he went out to the people, and neither do you. If you profess to be Christian, and at your heart there nestles unbelief in the miracles of Jesus and the supernatural. But I'd be in danger of preaching a sermon, and I mustn't do that because it isn't Sunday. Um, (laughs) So we'd better get back to this central thing. It was sheer power of evidence that convinced Zacharias. So get this. These New Testament writers were not primitive. They faced the 21st century problem. It's exactly the same problem. But the second argument is, our knowledge of the laws of nature makes belief in miracles impossible. Now, here we come to this word violation of the laws of nature. And when I'm in America, I see these notices all over the place. Violators will be towed. Have you ever noticed that? We don't use the word violate in that circumstance. But it's talking about there's a law of the state. And if you violate it, it'll be told. The confusion here is because we don't know the difference between a law of nature and a law of the state. Let me try and explain that. Now here I'm going back to C.S. Lewis, who was a genius at thinking of analogies to educate our thinking. I'm going to translate it into American. (laughs) If... This week I put a thousand dollars, there's the American, in the drawer of my desk, add two thousand next week and another thousand the week thereafter, the laws of arithmetic allow me 
to predict that the next time I come to my drawer, I will find $4,000. But suppose the next time I open the drawer, I find only $1,000. What should I conclude? That the laws of arithmetic have been broken? Or that the laws of the state have been broken? Now think about it. What should I conclude? Well, clearly that the laws of the state have been broken. Somebody has put their hand into the drawer and taken $3,000 out. How do I know that? Because the laws of arithmetic have not been broken. Do you get that? It's your knowledge of the laws of arithmetic that tells you that someone has put their hand in you see, the laws of nature, the laws of science, are not like the laws of the state. They are simply descriptions of what normally happens. One plus two plus one is four. But they do not prevent somebody putting their hand into the system and taking the $3,000 out. And that is extremely important because it illustrates all aspects of this. You see, in order to recognize that Jesus' resurrection is a genuine supernatural event, you have to know that dead bodies regularly stay dead. If they popped up all over the place, you wouldn't think it was anything special that Jesus rose. You have to know that regularity now, did Jesus' resurrection break the law of nature that people normally stay dead? No. You see, if I was claiming to you that Jesus rose from the dead by natural processes going on in the tomb before it happened, then it would be breaking the laws of nature. But I'm claiming no such thing. What the New Testament claims is God raised him from the dead. That is, there was an injection of power and energy from outside the system. It didn't happen by any natural means. It happened by supernatural intervention or input of power from outside. And we recognize that by all the tests of investigating the evidence that's given to us in the New Testament and elsewhere. You see, saying that God can't intervene in nature would be like claiming that the moment you understood the laws of internal combustion, that that made it impossible to believe that the designer of a motor car could or would intervene and remove the cylinder head. Of course they could intervene. Moreover, the intervention wouldn't destroy the laws of internal combustion. The very same laws that explained why the engine worked with the cylinder head on would now explain why it doesn't work with the cylinder head off. So we need to clear this up. The laws of nature are not like the laws of a country that you violate. They are descriptions of what normally happens. But God, who is the creator and stands above its creation and outside it, is perfectly free to input events into the system. And that is exactly what the miracles of Jesus are and what the resurrection is. So Christians, far from denying the laws of nature, have got to believe in the laws of nature in order to even to talk rationally about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, we could go into some detail in demonstrating that Hume simply assumes what he's got to prove when he talks about experience showing that miracles never happen. He simply assumes what he wants to prove. And his argument runs into trouble. How does he know? You see, in order to know that experience against miracles is absolutely uniform, he would need to have total access to every event in the history of the universe at all times and places, which is impossible. He seems to have forgotten that human beings 
have only observed a tiny fraction of the sum total of events which have occurred in the universe. Therefore, Hume cannot know that miracles have never occurred. He simply assumes what he wants to prove. The only alternative to that is to be open to the possibility that they do occur, but he denies that possibility. He says, experience against miracles is firm and unalterable, but that is no substance unless he do shows that all reports of miracles are false, particularly the ones in the New Testament that describe the resurrection of Jesus. Now, Hume's very interesting because he goes on to talk about why should we believe testimony? And that's very interesting. He lays down criteria for testimony, and some of them are very sensible. A wise man proportions his belief to the evidence. The strength of his belief depends upon the strength of the evidence that supports the belief. Now, that's enormously important because there's a widespread impression these days that faith is believing where you know there's no evidence. That's what Dawkins thinks. Ladies and gentlemen, faith in the New Testament is never that. It's believing where there is evidence. The word faith in English comes from the Latin word fides, which means trust. We get fidelity from it. And the normal use of the word is trust based on evidence. And you'll discover that may, that what that means the next time you go to get a loan from your bank manager. You want evidence before he gives you the loan, won't he? His trust in you has got to be evidence-based. But unfortunately, in the world of the academy that I inhabit, there's a widespread impression that faith is a religious word and it means believing where there's no evidence. That is completely wrong. And John, the writer in the New Testament, who gives us a lot of evidence on the resurrection of Jesus, he sums up what he's doing by saying this, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written in order that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life in his name. Here's the evidence upon which faith can be based. If Christianity wasn't evidence-based, you wouldn't have the New Testament because it claims to be evidence. It's a completely false idea. And Hume is right, and he's saying a big claim requires big evidence. Of course it does. And therefore, we need to investigate those things that will lead us to a reasoned assessment of why we should believe that Jesus raised from the dead. And one of the things he says is, if the falsehood of the testimony to an event like the resurrection would be more miraculous than the event itself, then I would have to believe the testimony, but not until then. You see, if someone claims something like Jesus rose from the dead, I have to decide whether it's true or false. If the character of the witness is dubious, then you might dismiss the story out of hand. But then you investigate the moral integrity of the witness. What about the people that wrote the New Testament? Were they morally compromised? No, they went out into the world in the name of truth and purity and morality. They stuck to this story. That's powerful evidence that they themselves actually believed it. How otherwise would you explain their stance? Were they fraudsters? Well, I shall never forget sitting in Trinity College, Cambridge, listening to one of the brightest legal scholars in the world of his time, Professor Sir Norman Anderson. And he's written a lovely little book, which I recommend to you even today, Evidence for the Resurrection. And he says this, Easter is not primarily a comfort, but a challenge. Its message is either the supreme fact in history or else a gigantic hoax. If it is true that it is the supreme fact of history, and to fail to adjust one's life to its implications means irreparable loss. 
But if it is not true, if Christ be not risen, then the whole of Christianity is a fraud, foisted on the world by a company of consummate liars, or at best deluded simpletons. St. Paul himself realized this when he wrote, If Christ be not risen, then our preaching is meaningless and your faith worthless. And centuries before Hume, Paul saw the issue clearly. Either Christ is risen from the dead, or he and the others are deliberate perpetrators of fraud. But then the question cannot be avoided. Is it possible to believe that Christ's disciples were the kind of people who not only would concoct a lie, but foist it on other people and watch them go to their deaths from it, and themselves go to their own deaths for the whole thing? I find that very difficult to believe. But that has been investigated by many forensic scientists, and I leave you to them to investigate that. The other thing I want to mention is the historical fact of the meteoric rise of the Christian church from a non-proselytizing religion, Judaism. What is adequate to explain the transformation of the early disciples from a frightened group of men and women who were utterly depressed and disillusioned at what to them was the calamity that had befallen their movement when Jesus died. There suddenly explodes this powerful international movement which rapidly established itself all over the Roman Empire. The early disciples were all Jews, their religion not noted for its enthusiasm in making converts. And if you ask the early church, they will tell you immediately that what started it was the resurrection of Jesus. And their very existence, the meaning of their existence and its purpose was to bear witness to this fact. Professor C.F.D. Mole of Cambridge wrote, if the coming into existence of the Nazarenes, a phenomenon undeniably attested by the New Testament, rips a great hole in history, a hole the size and shape of the resurrection, what does the secular historian propose to stop it up with? The birth and rapid rise of the Christian church remain an unsolved enigma for any historian who refuses to take seriously the only explanation offered by the church itself. Now, I'm coming towards the end of this section of the lecture. There are many, many more things that could be said. And I would encourage you, if you're beginning an interest here, to begin yourself to interact. I just want to mention one thing that many years ago, I was perhaps about 17 when I first listened to a very bright academic uh, classicist by training talk about the resurrection. And he said there are innocent things that you'd hardly notice in the Gospels that are pointers that would never have been invented, never have been thought up in a fake story. And one of them is recorded in John's Gospel in chapter 20, where the women came and they said that the tomb was empty. Now that's very striking because Judaism did not regard the testimony of women very highly. And nobody faking a story would have ever claimed that women were the main bearers of the testimony. It's there because it's highly likely to be true. And they came and they said the tomb was empty and Peter and John ran to the tomb. And they went into the tomb. And when they went into the tomb, John saw something that utterly intrigued him. It was a Jewish tomb and the body would have been wrapped in grave cloths and heavy spices put on them. And he saw, it says, the grave clothes rolled up and the head cloth by itself. And then it says this, he saw and believed. Believe what? 
And he left the tomb. There was nothing more to be seen because what he had seen convinced him of the resurrection. What was it? He was like a detective. What he saw, according to the text, was the grave cloths were rolled up exactly as they had been on the body. How could that be possible? Because, you see, if somebody had removed the body, they would have had to unwind them and then wind them up again. That would have been practically impossible. It would have taken hours. But if nobody had removed the body, John, it was like lightning going through his head. He saw and he believed. And that sticks in my mind over all those years. And there are many such things that bring us step by step. It's cumulative evidence. But you know, there's more to it than that. And I want to read to you just a few words of, if I can find them. <clears throat> and I may not be able to find them, and it doesn't matter if I can't. But I wanted to find just a statement Twenty centuries ago, in the dawn of an oriental day, a woman distraught at finding an empty tomb in a garden near the place of crucifixion saw a man standing in the shadows. Thinking that he was the gardener, she asked him if he'd removed the body of Jesus. He spoke her name, Mary. And in a moment of overwhelming understanding, she realized that this was not the gardener, but the owner the Lord of creation, the one who is ultimately responsible not only for all the beauty of flowers and trees, but for the whole universe in all of its prodigious glory. Jesus had risen from the dead. Death itself had been overcome. Atheism is no answer to death, ladies and gentlemen, no ultimate hope to give. It's an empty and sterile worldview which leaves us in a closed universe that will ultimately incinerate any last trace that we ever existed. It is quite literally a hopeless philosophy. Its story ends in the grave, but the resurrection of Jesus opens the door in a bigger story. It's for each one of us to decide whether it's true or not. Now, my final point is this. I'm a scientist of sorts. And people say to me, come on. You can't believe this stuff. Because in science and practical science, you do experiments. You test your hypotheses. Christianity is not testable, isn't it? Isn't it? You see, the difference between the two last things I read were the difference between seeing something, those grave cloths, and working out an intellectual conclusion that something utterly remarkable has happened, that's not quite the same thing as meeting the risen Jesus. And you see, ladies and gentlemen, if it is true that Jesus rose from the dead, then he's still alive. And it's possible to meet him. Now, you can do an experiment. And it's this. This Jesus who claims to be risen tells us that if we're prepared to trust him, repent of the mess we've made of our own lives and the lives of other people, and we're prepared to receive him as Lord and controller of life as the risen Son of God, then he will give us forgiveness. Does the word forgiveness mean anything to you? He'll give us new life and a new power. And you know, I meet many people in life. And I'll tell you just one story to illustrate this. I was speaking to a huge crowd at Harvard University. And when I'd finished, a young Chinese student stood up at the balcony and he shouted to the whole crowd. He said, look at me. And of course, we all looked. And I said, why should we look at you? He said, listen, 
His face was radiant with joy. He said, six months ago, my life was in a mess as a student. And I don't know all the things he mentioned that were wrong with his life and so on. He was in total despair. And he said, someone brought me to a lecture that you gave at one of the Ivy League universities, but not Harvard. And he said, just look at me now. He said, I've found peace with God. My life has been completely transformed. I've discovered meaning. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is the test. When you see that in life again and again and again and again, when you see people with narcotic or alcohol dependence and they've no food to put on the table in front of their children, and you meet them then a year later and something has happened, you say, what's happened to you? And they say something like, well, I met Jesus or I became a Christian or they put it different ways. When you see that again and again, you add two and two and you get four. I wouldn't sit here for a nanosecond if I didn't believe that not only is the resurrection of Jesus intellectually credible, but I believe it's existentially credible. Because the center part of my life and that of my wife and family is to walk with him from day to day. Now that may sound absolute jargon and mumbo jumbo to you. But we're living in a universe where we discover that we are persons. And every analogy we know tells us that our origin cannot be subpersonal. It's suprapersonal. And if we enjoy human friendship, what a magnificent thing it is. If God makes a way where we can, through faith in Christ, become his sons and daughters and enjoy the biggest friendship and the most exciting friendship in the universe, and that is friendship with the risen Christ. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks, John. Thanks for coming. And uh, now we're going to open it up for some questions. So um, you mentioned discovering bones you haven't discovered. I'm getting to that point of living experience where my eyes are beginning to make it difficult to read small text messages on phones. But we'll uh, have an iPad. <laughs> have one. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, so, uh, several people have asked kind of an interesting question. Uh, if, you, if you look at the New Testament and whether you believe the New Testament to be true or not, if one thing that you do notice in the Gospels is that there are other resurrection stories in the Gospels. Jairus' daughter, uh, the raising of Lazarus, why is there so much focus on the particular resurrection event of Jesus of Nazareth? Well, I think, first of all, that they are not resurrections in the technical sense. They are raisings, and we presume that the people involved died again. Christ, the claim is, rose into an indissoluble life. This was an undoing of death. And the particular focus is, of course, this is the biggest thing in the universe. I think the Bible is absolutely right saying that behind all of our lives, there's a subliminal fear of death. None of us want to be extinguished because we recognize instinctively, it's the image of God in us, I believe, but we recognize instinctively that death is an alien in the universe. And so the biggest issue is, is there an answer to death? Or is death going to, as my atheist friends claim, is going to claim us all in the end, so that everything is, in terms of ultimate hope, hopeless. And that's why I find that the focus is there. Because remember, we're dealing not with a girl like Jairus' daughter or a person like Lazarus. We're dealing with 
the grand claim that Jesus is God incarnate, or in contemporary language, God coded into humanity. The Word became human. This is a colossal claim, and therefore it needs very substantial evidence to believe it. And I believe that here we have, in John's Gospel, which is one of the Gospels that's helped me most, it starts with a statement, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, the Word was God, the same was in the beginning with God. And then the Word becomes flesh, and we discover that the Word is the one we call Jesus. And John ends his Gospel with the vindication of that claim at the highest level, that he raised Jesus from the dead. Now there's an additional thing there, because this is a moral universe as well. And one of the big questions that bothers people, and rightly so, is the question of justice and ultimate justice. Atheism has no hope of ultimate justice. When the early apostles preached the resurrection, if you look through the basic history that Luke gives us in the book of Acts, you'll see they often connected it with a final judgment. And they were saying to people something wonderful, that their sense of morality is not an illusion. It's going to be backed up because there is going to be a final assessment. And the resurrection of Jesus proves that he is the Son of God and he is the final judge who's going to execute the judgment. These are spectacular claims. And C.S. Lewis, I think, was dead right in saying they're either true or they're absolutely crazy and we need to fight against them tooth and nail. Okay, thank you. Um, let's... Um turn to this whole idea of uh, evidence. Mm -hmm. So uh, you said we could read some books, but maybe we can just talk for a little bit about this, because it's a key point. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> um, um, and uh, David Hume, in fact, makes the argument. Um, I mean, people, I guess, debate what Hume was actually trying to say. Some people would they say... They do indeed. Yeah, and some people would say he's making a probability argument, you know, that um, we don't see miraculous events in our own experience, and so the, the bar for personal testimony sorts of evidence has to be unbelievably high for us to make it sufficiently probable to buy into it. And yes. that's one way to think about it. And so... so that places a, a very large burden on the personal testimony. So I wonder if you could talk about that, and then I have a couple of follow-ups. Well, I think actually he's wrong in saying we don't see uh, miracles, because every conversion that changes a person's life dramatically is in that sense a supernatural event. And I think it's important to recognize that. This is being born from above and is one of the most powerful evidences of the truth of Christianity. So I do think there's quite a lot of evidence. Now, of course, you can approach it from all kinds of view and psychologize it out of existence and say, well, they came across a new idea, etc. But if you're going to make it an argument from probability, the overwhelming constancy of the, this kind of thing happening and being connected with Jesus seems to me to be a powerful argument. Now, I want to interject something here. I'm a mathematician, and the word proof is used far too easily in these contexts. I don't think you can prove that Jesus rose from the dead in the mathematical sense. Because in the rigorous mathematical sense, the only things you can prove are in mathematics. I can't prove to you mathematically that my wife, to whom I've been married for nearly 50 years, loves me. Can't do it. But I'd risk my life for her. Because, you see, just because we can't prove it in that axiomatic, rigorous way doesn't mean there's formidable evidence. And I don't usually use the word proof. I suspect I didn't use it at all tonight for that very reason. We have evidence, but it's strong enough to base a commitment that is life-changing. And therefore, probabilistic arguments are important, but there are other kinds of arguments we need to bring into play. 
So let's uh, turn to the kind of the credibility of some of the, the testimony that we have. Several people um, were asking a similar question, and that is that um, why is the evidence presented for the resurrection somehow superior to other reports of amazing things, such as the raising of Pythagoras or um, the um, Muhammad's vision of the splitting of the moon or the Mormon witnesses to golden plates with spiritual eyes or things like that. What, what sets this apart, uh, especially for someone who's kind of coming from a posture of overall skepticism about these kinds of events? What yeah. would you say to them? Well, I would say, please be skeptical. Skeptine in Greek means to check out from a distance. And it's a very important thing to do, to check things out from a distance. And, and for me, it rests on evidence. I mean, let me take something that um, goes to the heart of this. For instance, my Jewish friends believe that Jesus died and didn't rise. My Muslim friends believe he didn't die. I believe he both died and rose. Those three accounts are mutually exclusive, obviously. How do you decide? I don't know any other way of deciding, ladies and gentlemen, but by actually investigating the evidence. There is no shortcut. There's no generic answer to this kind of question. Why do you take the New Testament more seriously than the Book of Mormon? Because I've read the Book of Mormon. I've looked at this, and I haven't found it convincing in the least. I know no other way, but you see, when it comes to Christianity, it's the final bit of my talk that weighs the most heavily with me, that if the resurrection is true, Jesus is still alive, and you can get to know him. This is something that just doesn't occur in any of these other spheres. And of course, the issues at stake aren't as big. The question of Pythagoras or Protagoras, I wasn't quite sure, I didn't quite hear. It's not making any big demands. We're not making a claim that this person is going to operate the final judgment. But in Christianity, we are. And therefore, you're dead right in saying that big claims need big evidence. But I think the big evidence is there. But we have to do the investigation. And why I emphasize is this that it's very easy to put up a smoke screen. What about this? What about that event? And so on. If you are serious about that, you will study every one of those events and come to your own conclusions. You won't rest content with a generic solution. Oh, the whole thing's impossible. The other way in is to say, what is the most serious of these questions? What is at stake? Where are the biggest things at stake? And it's very obvious to me that the question of forgiveness of sin, new life, and, a, and an eternal uh, relationship with God, and my own personal resurrection are far bigger things than a lot of the other things that are raised. But I still come back to this, we have to make up our own minds. I can't make up your mind for you, and I wouldn't dare to try. All I can do is share my own response to it, and commend it to you, and say, you go away and think about it and come to your own decision. Now, that may not answer your question, and if you feel it doesn't, hit me hard. <laughs> I like you, John. I you know, <laughs> want to avoid bodily injury here. All right, so um, this question is very well stated, so I'm just going to read it. Um, in the 2,000-plus years since Jesus of Nazareth's alleged resurrection, nothing like it's been able to be reproduced and tested. If we ask the question, can a scientist believe in the resurrection, this lack of reproducibility and testability leaves, in my opinion, any resurrection hypothesis indeterminate and unscientific. Can you comment on this? Sorry, I missed, I missed the end, but say it again. Um, the lack of reproducibility and testability of the resurrection leaves it, uh, any resurrection hypothesis indeterminate oh, and really? unscientific. Well... Those the two are not, not necessarily need to be tied together. Yes, well, the lack of reproducibility of the origin of the universe and of life leaves it very indefinite, doesn't it? <laughs> you see, what this is hitting at is very important. We use the word science, but we need to distinguish various kinds of science. The natural sciences 
And generally speaking, we think of inductive science, that is doing experiments and getting results, and that's a very important aspect of science. But you see, we can't repeat everything in the laboratory. We can't repeat the history of the universe. We can't repeat the history of life. We can't repeat many, many things. So what do we have to do? We have to play Sherlock Holmes. We have to do what's technically called abduction, inference to the best explanation. So here's the body of John Lennox lying on the floor of the church with a dagger in his heart. How are you going to account for that? Well, you can't say, let's do it again and see what happens. <laughs> and that's exactly what's at the back of this, you see. No, but you make an inference to the best explanation that um, uh, one of the people in the church was disgruntled seeing, seeing coming in and they were holding a knife and it looked suspiciously like the knife in there. And you say, well, if that's the case, that makes it plausible that that person was responsible. But then somebody else says, there are two knives like that in this building. And there was a chap up who's a knife thrower. Oh, well, that might explain it better. Which of the two explains it better? And we do that all the time. Now, to say that nothing like the resurrection of Jesus has occurred since then is to be expected, but there will be something like it. You see, we've got to take it within its contextual and historical claim. What happened? Christ came, he died, he rose again, but he did something else, he ascended. And I believe that too. And when he ascended, the beginning of Acts tells us that the disciples were all looking up into heaven as he went up, literally and physically, by the way, and then disappeared into the other world. And the disciples were told, well, why are you gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus will so come in the same way as you saw him go. You see, just as the incarnation, the life, death, resurrection, ascension of Christ broke the apparent uniformity. They don't fit into the uniformity of history or nature. But we're not finished, ladies and gentlemen. Christ has promised to come back again. And then that argument will cease to be used. But it'll be too late. <laughs> so that's my initial approach. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, you know, this is a Q&A. You've seen that. Desperately inadequate Q&As. Because all I can do is off the top of my head respond as to how I begin to think about them. That is not to say that there are more nuances and things that need to be thought about. Of course there are. But that's all I can do. So I'll try to keep doing it. Let me turn to a question. I actually came up at dinner. I thought it was a great question. I'm a scientist. And uh, the, uh, let me just preface this by a, a story we've mentioned, Christopher Hitchens, a couple of times. And he was very fond of um, uh, asking people, Christians particularly, uh, questions, things like, do you really believe that Jesus was born of a virgin? Did you really believe in the resurrection, and if the person said, well, yes, I, I do, then he would kind of turn to the audience, sort of like you're doing in some ways, John, and he yeah. would say, ladies and gentlemen, my opponent has just demonstrated that science has done nothing for his worldview. And this is a way of making the person seem like they lack imagination. Yeah, he somehow. was good at it, too. Yeah, he was very good at this. And, um, but the underlying implication is that somehow if you believe that supernatural events have occurred, that you are less imaginative as a scientist. I just wonder what you think about that. Not um, much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that lengthy <laughs> comment. I appreciate that, yeah. I understand it, of course. But it's an insult, really. Because if this story is true, then it is the story that fires the imagination beyond any other story. Think of C.S. Lewis and the legacy of imagination he left. 
what is behind this is the kind of thing that if you believe this stuff, it dumbs you down. It makes you seem of lower value than your peers. I think the opposite of it is true. It actually smartens you up because you're in touch with real reality instead of a tiny fraction of it that's given to you by materialism. Materialism is the most unimaginative stuff. I mean, think of Dawkins' conclusion about the universe. This universe is just like you'd expect it to be. If at bottom there's no good, no evil, and no justice, DNA just is, and we dance to its music. That's powerful imagination, isn't it? That'll inspire you at night. <laughs> now, as a corrective to that, I know all about this because I experienced it. I'm going to tell you a story, if I may. I was 19 at Cambridge. And we have nice dinners in the college, and I found myself, to my amazement, seated <clears throat> beside a Nobel Prize winner. Never met one before. Terrified. And of course, I do what I always do. I started asking questions. And slowly but surely, I moved towards the God question. And he didn't like it. So I'm a very kind Irishman. I backed off. And I thought that was the end of it. But at the end of dinner, he said, Lennox, please come to my room. And I could sense there was something. So I went to his room, and he invited two or three other professors, no students. He sat me in a chair. They stood around. He said, do you want a career in science? I said, yes, sir. Right, he said, I want you tonight, right now, in front of witnesses to give up these naive and infantile ideas of God. They will cripple you intellectually. You'll never make it. You will suffer by comparison with your peers. And you'll end up an intellectual non-entity. That was pressure. And I remember looking at him. And I said, sir, what have you got to offer me that's better than what I've already got? And he said, there's the philosophy of Emil Bergson. I happen to know what it was, because I'd read C.S. Lewis, you see. And I said, sir, if that's all you've got, with great respect, I will stick with what I've got, and I'll take the risk. And I got up and walked out. And I tell you, that put steel into my heart. And it's never left it. It was wonderful preparation to meet the Hitchens and Dawkins of this world. And you see, it's odd. Because if you take all Nobel Prize winners between 1900 and 2000, over 60% of them believed in God. Did you know that? This idea that science and God are incompatible, that belief in God removes your imagination. Goodness me, who invented the colors? Who invented the universe? I've discovered, you know, it doesn't take long to discover it if you approach it from the right perspective, that scientists did not invent the universe. <laughs> Nor did they invent the human mind. You see, we ought to be very humble people. We study a given with a given. And to think that the God who invented the whole thing is boring. Now, there is a legitimacy behind your question, Jeff. And that is the tragedy of evangelical rejection of an intellectual and cultural dimension to life. The attitude that we don't need to think about the glorious wonders that God has done in the universe. Now that, I'm not accusing you of that, of course I'm not, but I discover it. Where people of, mostly of a previous generation have been afraid of science and things like that. That is an absolute tragedy to paint a picture that the God who invented the human mind is anti-intellectual. I mean, that is just utterly absurd. The first commandment is what? Love the Lord your God with what? Your mind. And if more of us did it, we'd make more impact on the culture because they see some of us 
And our knowledge of our profession is way up there. We're brilliant at engineering or whatever it is. Our knowledge of the Bible and God and Scripture remains at second form level. And people, our colleagues, see it. They're not interested in what we have to say simply because it lacks that imagination. So I think there is a subtext here that's very important to listen to. I was told long ago, if you want people to find you interesting, you be interested. And don't be a monomaniac who can only talk about one topic. You'll soon find you have very few people to talk to. These are very important things, actually, that we really take seriously our Christianity and the creation dimension of it. And when we do that, people will be far more interested in the redemption dimension of it. Sorry to go on about that, but there we are. Let me ask one more question. Um, so you mentioned Bill Phillips. I'm actually on a committee through the American Association for the Advancement of Science with Bill. Really oh, great guy, really delightful Christian. And I look at someone like Bill Phillips, and then I look at some of the other people that you've mentioned, and there, seems, there seem to be differences in openness yes. or epistemic... Uh, so, so this is the idea of knowledge, what we can know, this epistemic openness. Like some people seem inherently unwilling or even angry at the suggestion that the resurrection might actually have happened. I think you mentioned Spinoza and yes. Stephen Hawking, and that, that's sort of an idea that there's sort of a, there's, a, there's an anger there. And let me just read you something from Thomas Nagel, a philosopher who I, I know you're kind of interested in some of the things that he's written lately. This is from a book called The Last Word. Here's what he said. I speak from experience. This is talking about religious people, and he himself is an atheist. I speak from experience, being strongly subject to this fear myself. I want atheism to be true, and I'm made uneasy by the fact that some of the most intelligent and well-informed people I know are religious believers. It isn't just that I don't believe in God and naturally hope that I'm right in my belief. It's that I hope there is no God. I don't want there to be a God. I don't want the universe to be like that. So I just wonder, how, what would you recommend for everyone, no matter which side of the equation they're on at this moment, how would you encourage them to inculcate a sense of openness to evidence, mm. to consider all of the evidence, to think about these things deeply rather than and Nagel's very honest, which I appreciate very much, but I think a lot of us kind of react in this way. How, mm -hmm. how? I was actually deeply moved when I read that by Nagel, because for a philosopher of his eminence to say something like that is very costly, and he's in huge criticism, especially from people like Dawkins and so on. So I have great respect for that. And he, he's really beginning to see some of the implications of naturalism. And he doesn't like them intellectually because they seem to undermine rationality and so on. Well, I, what can I say? I encourage people, I try to befriend people first of all, because you can't get very far in these discussions if they're hostile. And uh, all the people I debate in public, I try to go out for a meal with them and have a drink with them and have a good conversation with them so that I get to know them on other levels than on these spiky points and on these difficult points. I find the really great scientists are much more open than the lesser people. Mm. Much more open, much more honest uh, with what they don't know. Uh, Richard Feynman was a brilliant example of this. I just don't know. He'd say all the time, how do you expect me to know about this? And he was really the towering genius of 20th century American physics, world physics indeed. And to get alongside people and share, what I find is very important is to listen. Now that's difficult for some of us. To listen to people, what moves them and what motivates them. Now, when I detect anger, and there is real anger in some people, I will say so. If I feel that the atmosphere is right, 
I'll say, look, I'm sorry, I may be wrong, but tell me. I get the impression that it's not that you just don't believe in God, you're angry about it. What makes you angry? I remember once I was an academic got a doc in Novosibirsk in Siberia in a huge, big meeting, and I, I was asked to speak, and I was attacked, viciously attacked by a very bright chap who really plowed into me. And this anger came out very clear. So after I'd finished, and he'd finished, he, he interrupted, grabbed the microphone, disrupted the whole program to rant and rail against me. <laughs> so afterwards, I came and sat down. I said, why don't we go for a drink? He said, you want to? I said, sure, I'd love to. I'd love, I'd love to talk to you. I said, you're angry, aren't you? He said, I am. I said, it's got nothing to do with logic or intellect, has it? He said, how do you know? I said, because you talk nonsense. <laughs> <coughs> and I said, when I hear somebody talk nonsense, I know that they're hurting. And I said, you're hurting, aren't you? He said, I'm hurting. He said, I had a, such a negative experience of what seemed to be Christianity in a seminar as a boy that it poisoned my whole system. And I said, you're being honest. I understand that. We talked for hours. And we ended friends. Because he came out with a hurt. And even at the student level, it was one of the first lessons I learned at Cambridge. I was sitting at dinner, and uh, I was talking about the resurrection. And I was surrounded by big rugby types. They're like big American football types, you know, the size of a house and weighing about 500 pounds each, and they, they terrify you. So this student opposite me was saying, why do you believe the resurrection? I tried to keep my voice down so these big guys wouldn't hear, but of course, everybody got quieter and quieter. <laughs> until, and then about, the man about three down lost his temper, and he slammed the table and all the glasses and the the silver jumped on the table and he said, for goodness sake, stop talking about that absolute rubbish, you see. So that was a challenge, of course. And I turned to him and I said, gosh, you feel strongly about that. He said, I certainly do. You mustn't talk like that because it's absolute nonsense. So I looked at him and said, tell me, what did you make of the evidence given by the Apostle Paul when you read it? He said, what? I said, you heard me. He said, I've never read it. I said, well, where does the strength of your feeling? Why don't you come back for a cup of coffee? So he did. 20 minutes later, he said, you know what? He said, my parents ran this stuff down my throat, and I just don't want it. I said, that's the first honest thing you've said to me tonight. He became a Christian 10 minutes later. <laughs> and he's a minister somewhere in the world now today. It just shows that sometimes the anger is the thing that needs to be focused on, but you need to earn the right to do it. Of course, Christians sometimes come from a posture of anger as well. So They do, and this is a tragedy. And you see, I come from Northern Ireland, and I was expecting this question all the time. How can you possibly believe any of this stuff when you come from a country that's driven by sectarian terrorism? But since nobody asked it, I won't answer it. <laughs> you, can see my, you can see my answer to it in this book. Great. Well, we're out of time. Thanks, John, thanks so much for joining us. And thanks to all of you for listening. We want to thank you for being here tonight. Just a couple of, of comments, and then we'll close. Um, is this the type of event that you would like to see in Madison on an annual event? Okay. One of the... I would, too, and that's why when I had the opportunity to meet uh, Andrew Schumann, you want to stand up and so we can say thank you to you? The reason we're saying thank you to Andrew is because he represents the Veritas Forum out of Cambridge, Massachusetts, and puts these kinds of events, typically on university campuses, 
uh, around our nation together. And when we first talked uh, tomorrow night, you may not know there's an event on campus for students. And as we began to talk, what, seven, eight months ago, um, I was at that initial meeting. I said, you know, I, I don't want to take up student seats with adults from the community. And so would it be okay if we hosted one at High Point Church because we have an auditorium that can handle that? And he was like, I think so. And uh, I'll talk to uh, the person that we bring in. We did not know it would be Dr. Lennox at that point in time. And so in working with Andrew and, and Veritas, We've talked about the opportunity to, regardless of what the campus ministries want to do this next year, of continuing this and making it an annual event here in Madison. There's really two reasons that we want to do this. One, Jesus in Matthew 22 uh, said what Dr. Lennox quoted as the first commandment, that we are to know God, to love him with our body, soul, and mind. And there's no excuse for a Christian to leave their mind at the door. And we want to educate the Christian community. We also want to give opportunity for those of you that were invited tonight to come in to hear a lecture from somebody other than the local preacher. Because even though things may be said the same, there's credibility when you look across the aisle at somebody that has an academic stature greater than yours. And so we are thankful that you are here. If you want to continue this conversation, I just invite you to continue it with the person that brought you. And that may have just put the, God, the fear of God in some of you. But um, we need to struggle. We need to look. We need to study from afar, as was suggested. If you are a skeptic, I just challenge you to be an honest skeptic. And then when you see truth, that you test it. And you step in towards the relationship with Jesus Christ and see what happens in your life. There will be transformation, as has been talked about this evening. One other just housekeeping thing, events like this cost, and I want to thank Door Creek and Blackhawk and High Point Church for their financial contributions. If you would like to participate in that contribution, there's a donation box between the doors on the way out, and uh, we gladly receive that, both to help cover some things for tonight, but also to ensure that we'll be in contact with Andrew this year to do this again this next fall. Would it be okay if I closed us in prayer? Thank you, Father, that you created us to be inquisitive so that we would find you. You created us with a need to find you. You gave us great minds. Help us to use them wisely in search of you to understand your word, as Paul said to Timothy, study. Show yourself approved to handle God's word well. You haven't called us to follow you blindly. You've given us evidence. You've given us experience. You've given us the ability to test. And then you've continued to walk with us as we understand you more and more in our, our daily lives. Thank you for the opportunity to listen to Dr. Lennox tonight, Dr. Hardin. We want to ultimately give you thanks, for the truth belongs to you. In Jesus' name.